royal nudes. Queen Victoria developed a sophisticated appreciation for art, one that embraced the beauty of the human form more openly than might be expected, especially for a queen. An exhibition showcasing the artworks exchanged between her and Prince Albert unveiled that Victoria's artistic preferences veered towards the more provocative in contrast to Albert's more reserved taste. She liked it nude, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. She liked getting nude. She liked the looking at the nude stuff. That's her thing. Among the pieces that she selected for her husband were paintings rich in nudity, such as William Edward Frost's Una among the fawns and wood nymphs. That's a personal favorite of mine. Or paintings such as the disarming of Cupid. Victoria commissioned a personal portrait known as the secret picture intended solely for Albert's eyes. No looking, that's it, it's just for this man alone. While its allure might seem odd by today's standards, the portrait's depiction of Victoria reflect the era's sensibilities. They liked it very pale and veiny. If you had a vein back then, oh, Maxim, here we come. Obsession with death. Following Prince Albert's death in 1861, Victoria's grief manifested into an all-out obsession with mourning rituals. She wore black for the remainder of her life and kept Albert's rooms as they were, with fresh clothes laid out daily. Yikes. That's why every time you see Queen Victoria in a textbook, she always looks like Winona Ryder from Beetlejuice. She's wearing all the black stuff. She looks very spooky. She's forever mourning. Queen Victoria's profound mourning for Prince Albert set a trend throughout the Victorian era. Her public display of grief popularized strict mourning protocols and fashion within British society. This included wearing black mourning clothes, using mourning stationery, and observing extended periods of, you guessed it, mourning. We got this all from the Queen of Death herself. Maybe that's why I wear black all the time. Maybe it's because I'm English, Queen Victoria, maybe that's why. Or I love death. That's also weird. Hate being pregnant. Despite having nine children, Queen Victoria was not fond of pregnancy or even babies for that matter. She described the former as an ordeal and the latter as ugly. Yeah, she just called her babies ugly. That's, that's awesome. I love that. We're expecting. Yeah, we're expecting quite the ordeal that is. <laughs> her journals candidly express her discomfort and lack of maternal feelings towards her newborns. Now, many believe that Victoria's hatred towards motherhood was the time that it took from her romantic life with Albert. More than fair, not enough date nights, okay. She was an extremely sensual woman who enjoyed the pleasures of marriage, if I can say that, but she kept getting pregnant. Albert needs to learn how to, know what I'm saying? Queen Victoria had to propose to her own husband. How crazy is that? In an era bound by strict protocols, one can only imagine the outrage when Queen Victoria broke norms by proposing to Prince Albert, her cousin in 1839. Also, yeah, her, her cousin. We'll get into that later. It's royal tradition that nobody shall propose to a reigning monarch, so in October 1839, Victoria asked Albert for his hand in marriage. She didn't have a royal tinder or anything like that. Victoria didn't have a lot of options in the love department, okay? They were 17 years old when they first met, and Victoria met the young prince at Kensington Palace. They were put together because Victoria's uncle felt like this could be beneficial to the throne. So yeah, it was arranged from the very beginning. First cousins getting married sounds bizarre, but it's nothing compared to what you're about to hear, oh boy. Queen Victoria became the first monarch to take up residence in Buckingham Palace in 1837, marking a significant moment in British royal history. Her accession to the throne prompted the move into the newly completed palace, which until then had seen gradual expansions and renovations from a private house into a residence, of course, fit for a queen. Victoria's decision to move into Buckingham Palace was driven by the need for a more modern and spacious royal residence that could accommodate the administrative functions of the monarch monarchy, and of course by growing the royal family. We needed somewhere bougie, right? Somewhere where the Peaky Blinders would gather and have their meetings and smoke inside. Somewhere cool like that. Her move symbolized the palace's official status as the primary residence of the British monarch, a tradition that continues to this very day. Every year on May 24th, we set off fireworks, enjoy a day off, eat like six hot dogs. It's a good time up here. It's called Victoria Day. And this weekend tradition started back in 1819, when Victoria was christened on an almost private ceremony. It was small, but well, it lasted for a while. Victoria's uncle only let a few people come also. This is a very private event. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal enough. It was of French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time. So when the throne snuck up on her, she was advised to change her name as something more traditional. But as our calendars tell us today, she said, 
nah, I'm good. I'll keep the name. On May 29th, 1842, Prince Albert was riding with Queen Victoria in their open carriage after attending a Sunday morning service at the Royal Chapel at St. James's Palace. Now he saw, quote, a little swarthy, ill-looking rascal, end quote, standing outside and pointing a small flintlock weapon in his direction. Now he watched as John Francis attempted to fire said weapon, but the weapon failed to fire. Yeah, dodged the bullet, literally. The man then tucked his piece underneath his coat and then disappeared into Green Park. Presumably quite embarrassed. What a failure also right off the top. But imagine describing somebody as a little swarthy, ill-looking rascal. That's the part that cuts deep. That's an insult right there. We're gonna bring that back. In 1840, Queen Victoria made history by being featured on the world first adhesive postage stamp, known as the Penny Black. This step was part of a broader postal reform led by Sir Rowland Hill, aiming to make mail services more accessible and efficient across Britain. Buddy, wait until you see email. You're going to shit your pants. Featuring Victoria's profile, based on a sketch by William Wyon from when she was 15, the Penny Black marked a revolution in communication, symbolizing the Queen's role in pioneering modern postal services. She's the face of mail. Imagine being the face of the postal system. That's amazing. Her image on the stamp underscores the monarchy's endorsement of his groundbreaking public service. Kensington system. To shape the future monarch, Queen Victoria's mother and Sir John Conroy devised the Kensington system. This was a terrible time. This was a terrible idea. This was a strict protocol restricting Victoria's independence and ensuring her constant surveillance. Yeah, horrible. This meant that Victoria was never allowed to be alone. Her mother even shared her bedroom and she couldn't navigate stairs unaided. Talk about clingy. Despite such close watch, Victoria experienced profound isolation, barred from connecting with her royal peers or engaging with other children. It's just being locked away in a tower at that point. The intent behind this brutal control was to dominate and influence Victoria upon her ascension to the throne. However, they didn't account for her strong spirit and determination because upon turning 18, Victoria's initial demands were for an hour alone and a personal bedroom, marking her first steps towards independence. Imagine that you're a queen and you're like, hey, can I have an hour alone? Maybe just one a day? That'd be cool, thanks so much. Dolls for friends. Deprived of the company of other children growing up, young Victoria found solace and companionship in her collection of dolls. Creepy, but it makes sense. It is estimated that she once owned hundreds with 132 surviving to this day, and she engaged in play with them all up until the age of 14. Me too. Actually 15, I think it was. A little bit later than usual. While the dolls themselves were simple in design, Victoria lavished them with elaborate costumes that she crafted herself by hand. How amazing is that? Utilizing luxurious materials like fine silk, delicate lace, and even miniature jewels, she transformed all of these dolls into figures of distinction. They got treated better than the people of England. She's like, ah, and you get a shirt. How fun is that? They were arrayed as members of the royal court, including one fashioned after Queen Elizabeth I, as well as characters from popular plays, opera, and ballets, reflecting the creativity and imagination of the future queen. Yeah, I had like two Batmans growing up and they never got along. Those guys, they didn't sort it out. Not at all. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. We'll see you next time on Bumblebee. Peace. And the disarming of Cupid, which is also, oh, I said, uh, 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 Albert needs to learn how to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> is that inappropriate, just doing this? You can't prove what that is. <clears throat> uh, f me. Uh, by more modern and spacious royal resident, royal residents, f me. First stamp. Mm -mm -mm.